Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Philip Munoz. I'm the director of uh, the Tocqueville Program for Inquiry into Religion and Public Life uh, at the University of Notre Dame, where I also teach. Uh, the Tocqueville Program is co-sponsoring uh, uh, our event today, and we're, we're just very pleased to be able to be here with you and to uh, support what the Thomistic Institute uh, is doing. Uh, so thank you very much for, for having us, uh, and uh, it's um, just a, a joy and a pleasure to advance uh, this very interesting conversation about natural rights. Thank you for coming. <laughs> it is, uh, it, it is uh, an ex extraordinary joy for me to introduce our, our next speaker. Uh, Father Dominic Legg is uh, Assistant Director of the Thomistic Institute. He tells me he actually runs the whole program, but he's the <laughs> Assistant Director of the Thomistic Institute and an Assistant Professor of, in Systematic Theology at uh, the Pontifical Faculty of the Immaculate Conception in Washington. D.C. at the Dominican House of Studies. Uh, a few months ago, Oxford University Press published his first book, The Trinitarian Christology of St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, he also co-hosts a weekly uh, radio show on EWTN Radio. He holds a uh, JD from Yale Law School, a PHL from the School of Philosophy of the Catholic University of America, and a doctorate in Sacred Theology from the University of Freiburg in Switzerland. Uh, he entered the Dominicans in 2001, after having practiced constitutional law for, for several years as a trial attorney uh, at the Department of Justice. Uh, most importantly to me, uh, he's my high school locker mate and my college roommate uh, and a good and true friend, Father Dominic. Do Thomists have rights? In the standard account of the historical development of the idea of natural rights, the watershed innovation is typically said to be the notion that individuals, individual persons themselves possess rights. That is, we can not only judge something to be right by nature in an objective sense, but that individual human subjects have natural rights that they can maintain over against others. Some view this development in a positive light as the crucial foundation for contemporary doctrines of human rights, others regard it as a corruption of classical theories of justice and the beginning of the decay and decadence of contemporary liberal regimes. Now, for centuries, Thomists, that is, those who lay claim to the principles and heritage of St. Thomas Aquinas, Thomists have played a prominent role in the history of these ideas. In the early 16th century, Dominican Thomists, like Francisco de Vitoria, who we heard about just a few minutes ago, Domingo de Soto, and Bartolomé de las Casas, also cited by uh, Dr. Bigger, were instrumental in the development of a theory of natural rights that would serve to limit the power of the Spanish crown and of colonial masters over the natives of the New World. And in the 20th century, Jacques Maritain mounted a principled campaign as a Thomist for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Yet a lively debate has developed in recent decades over the Thomistic pedigree of subjective rights. Were these later Thomists, in fact, faithful to the principles of Thomas Aquinas? Is there a doctrine of subjective rights in Aquinas? And if not, is it an organic development from Thomas's own views? Or more generally, may Aquinas, be, may Aquinas's thought be used to ground a theory of subjective natural rights? It's my claim that questions like these miss the point. And worse, they hide the fact that in the centuries after Aquinas, some putative Thomists diverged in important ways from Aquinas' own principles. The resulting so-called Thomistic theories of natural rights involved a shift in perspective that has worked mischief in the domain of natural rights theory. So recovering Aquinas' own views is, I believe, quite important if we are to have a healthy understanding of what a healthy political order is like. Yet contemporary commentators on these disputed questions about objective versus subjective rights, they have generally failed to recognize that some 
supposedly Thomistic theories are only masquerading as Thomistic theories. So in order to bring this to view, I will start in, uh, my talk will have three uh, parts. So the first part will discuss Aquinas' view, then the second part, how a key dimension of Aquinas' thought became eclipsed in the thought of subsequent thinkers, especially thinkers like William of Ockham, we've already heard something about him, but also Francisco Suarez and subsequent Jesuit and Jesuit-influenced Thomists. Suarez was a Jesuit. And finally, in part three, I'll argue that recovering this dimension of Aquinas' thought is vital in order to ground natural rights and a healthy contemporary political order. So, part one. Thomas Aquinas on law, justice, and use. Did Thomas Aquinas recognize subjective natural rights? In essence, I think the answer to this question is yes. But focusing exclusively on this question, which is where most contemporary debate has focused, obscures Aquinas' understanding of the complex interrelationship between justice, law, or lex in Latin, and right, ius, I-U-S, and the common good. So let's start with justice. In his great synthetic work, the Summa Theologiae, Aquinas first discusses justice with respect to God as an attribute of God. And in doing so, Aquinas affirms a key principle. Justice always refers to a wise or reasoned order among things. So when we speak about justice in God, we are referring, first of all, to the divine intellect insofar as God's intellect conceives the perfectly wise plan by which all things in creation are ordered back to God. Justice is only secondarily in God's will, insofar as by his will he then acts according to the plan he has conceived in his intellect. So this view of Aquinas's about justice being first in the intellect is very different from later theories, especially voluntaristic theories, nominalist theories, according to which the decree of God's will, which we're bound to obey, is the ultimate root of justice and law. For Aquinas, law is not primarily the expression of God's will. Rather, the wisely ordered plan of creation in God's intellect is like a law that guides the perfectly just willing of God. Aquinas actually says that very explicitly. God's plan in his intellect is like a law for his willing. So law, then, for Aquinas, is an expression of reason an ordering according to reason, even in God. And so justice results from rightly willing according to the wise or reasoned ordering of all things back to God. Now later in the Summa, Aquinas treats of justice in human affairs. And there he speaks of it as a moral virtue in the soul by which man is made good. That is, Aquinas treats human justice as part of a broader account of how man is ultimately ordered to God within the complex network of overlapping relationships he has with others, like his family, his neighbors, his city, and so forth. And in fact, Aquinas defines justice in precisely these terms. So listen to this quotation from, from Aquinas. Justice, by its nature, implies a certain rectitude of order. Inasmuch as it implies a right order in man's act, and thus justice is placed amongst the virtues, either as particular justice, which directs man by regulating them in relation to another individual man, Aquinas is talking about the order between human persons, or as legal justice, which directs a man's acts by regulating them 
in relation to the common good of a multitude. That would be the relationship of one individual person to, say, uh, the larger community. So this text brings into the foreground another key dimension of justice for Aquinas. It implies not only that there is a wise or reasoned ordering, but more specifically, an ordering to the good. So it's an ordering always to a good and an ordering that makes man good. So when you order yourself to the good, you are being made good. So at this point, we have identified three key elements to Aquinas' account of justice. It involves one, an ordering, two, according to reason, and three, to the good. So with these elements in mind, we're now ready to take up a key term in theories of natural rights and natural justice, ius, I-U-S. Thomas says that ius is the object of justice. One is just when one renders to another his ius. What does that mean? So this, this word ius in Latin is hard to translate into English. Standard translations usually render it as, the, as, as right, but it can also mean the just thing or what is due. We could also say that ius designates what is right or perhaps even the fair. The term itself is drawn from the Roman legal tradition. Roman judgments were called a ius, a judge would declare the ius in a particular case. And sometimes ius can even be translated as law. Although Aquinas thinks that's not quite correct, especially when we're speaking of a written law, he explains, the ius is the measure and the intelligible form of the law. In the same way that an artisan's idea in his mind of the table he is going to make is the mental exemplar, the blueprint and measure of what he produces. So the measure is first in the mind and then the artisan goes to work on the wood of the table. And in a similar way, yus is in a way the measure of a law. Aquinas' point is that we judge whether an action is just or whether a law is just by reference to this objective measure or object of justice. Have I given the other his yus? That is what is fair, what is due. But right here, we now encounter a misunderstanding, a very common one. Aquinas certainly thinks that justice always has this objective dimension. The use is an object of justice. It's something out there that regulates, regulates and equalizes human relationships. And this has led some people to argue or to think that Aquinas presents an understanding of use and thus of right or rights as exclusively objective, or at least in a predominantly objective sense. This objective sense of jus is then contrasted with later natural rights theories, where theorists begin to use the term jus, the same word, to designate a right or a claim that belongs to an individual that that person can assert over against other people. Here, the argument goes, we find the origin of a modern understanding of subjective <coughs> rights, rights as belonging to a person, a kind of moral faculty that characterizes individual subjects. So that's the common misunderstanding, that Aquinas has an objective sense of use, it's the object of justice, and he doesn't really think of rights that belong to a person. The use is out there, not belonging to me. But if one accepts Aquinas' account of use as the object of justice, it does not at all follow 
that jus could not also be understood as a subjective right or a claim that I can make against you or someone else. In fact, this is just to reformulate what Aquinas is saying from a different perspective. The reason Aquinas emphasizes that jus is the object of justice and that it has an objective character is to underline that what is due in any particular case doesn't depend on the characteristics of the, the just man, the way an act of temperance depends on the character of the person engaging in the act. So an NFL football player eats much more food and remains temperate than a sedentary Dominican professor of theology who, who can't temperately eat the same quantity. So the measure of temperance depends very much on the, the character of the actor. But the measure of justice does not. That's Aquinas' point. It's out there rather than in the actor. So this is what Aquinas means. Justice has a certain objective quality because there is a kind of out there-ness to the use, to what is due. Even so, it is still possible to speak about this objective use from the perspective of the person to whom it is owed. And even to claim that, or even to suggest that a person can make a claim for what is due to him, that he has a right to it. This is just to look at the objective use from the point of view of the person to whom it is due. So my argument on this point cuts against the grain of much of the recent scholarship on Thomistic natural rights, no less an authority than Ernest Fortin, the eminent Jesuit priest and Straussian who taught for many years at Boston College, claims that the notion of subjective rights based on natural law or natural justice is absent or even entirely foreign to Aquinas' thought. He really thinks Aquinas does not have this idea. Now, Fortin concedes that the research of other historians like Brian Tierney, another major figure in uh, recent scholarship, he's a historian of natural rights and of canon law in particular, Fortin concedes that Tierney shows that even before Aquinas, canon lawyers formulated subjective rights based on positive law, like positive church canon law. But this is a far cry, Fortin thinks, from grounding subjective rights on natural law principles. And for his part, Tierney and other scholars like him whose scholarship is generally regarded as the standard historical account of the development of subjective rights in Western uh, thought, Tierney accepts the dichotomy between objective and subjective rights. And he thinks that Aquinas represents the objective rights tradition and doesn't have a theory of subjective rights. So in my view, both Fortin, who likes Aquinas and think, thinks that he has a, a theory of objective rights, and Tierney, who who thinks that Aquinas doesn't have a, a theory of subjective rights and criticizes him perhaps for that, or, well, maybe that's putting it too strongly. In any case, I think both of them are mistaken. If you read beyond the narrow slice of the Summa that political theorists are wont to consult, Aquinas very explicitly speaks of what is objectively due to, someone's, uh, to someone as a subjective right or use that that person can possess or assert. So I've come across at least 25 different examples of such subjective rights in Aquinas. So here are some examples. Aquinas says that free men, this is a quotation, free men have the right and capacity, jus et, et facultatem, in some cases to resist the precepts of a king or a prince. In other words, the king's just authority is limited and this same truth can be expressed as a right or a faculty belonging to free citizens. Elsewhere, Aquinas says that in some matters, a free citizen has a right of contradicting a ruler, a jus contradicendi, he says, 
which suggests a right to contradict in speech or even oppose a ruler, as well as to refuse compliance with the ruler's command. St. Thomas also says that if someone has suffered an injury, a private person, and here's another quotation, is able to prosecute his right, jus suum, in the tribunal of his superior. In other contexts, Aquinas speaks of an adopted child having a right or a jus in the family inheritance, or the finder of buried treasure as having a right in it, or of a baptized person who has a right to receive the Eucharist, or even of the church as having rights, jura, that should be defended against usurpation by civil rulers. He refers explicitly to Thomas A. Becket and King Henry, Henry II of England. He even refers to certain communities that have a right, a jus, to provide themselves with a king, and hence also as having the capacity to depose a king who becomes a tyrant. Now, many of these are, in fact, quite close to what later theorists will label natural rights. And Aquinas speaks about them quite openly. One more example is worth mentioning, because in it, Aquinas expressly argues that a right possessed by an individual is based on natural law. So it's found in one of his quadlibital disputations from when he was teaching at the University of Paris. And the title, quadlibit, of this disputation literally means ask whatever you please. So we're going to have a quadlibital uh, panel discussion at the end of our conference. You can ask whatever you please. So in this case, a questioner asked whether one may baptize Jewish infants even if their parents object. And here's Aquinas's answer. It would injure Jewish parents if their children were baptized, notwithstanding their objections, because it would violate their right of parental governance, jus paterne potestatis. The reason is that it is of natural right, de jure naturali, that a son is under the care of his father until he gains the use of reason. And hence, it would be contrary to natural justice if before a child has the capacity for free choice, the term Aquinas uses there, liberi arbitrii, means the, the full capacity of free will in someone who's attained the use of reason, normally about age seven. So he says, it would be contrary to natural justice if before a child has the capacity for free choice, he were taken away from his parents' care, or if something were ordered concerning him over his parents' objections. But after he begins to have the use of free choice, then he begins to be his own. Incipit esse suus. And he is then able to provide for himself with respect to those things that concern observing divine or natural law. At that point, he can consent to the faith and be baptized, even if his parents object, though he must not be induced to accept the faith by coercion, but only by persuasion, yet not before he has the use of reason. OK, that's the end of the quotation. In this remarkable text, Aquinas speaks of the parents as suffering an injury if they are deprived of their use to raise and govern their children. No positive law, Aquinas thinks, can contravene this right, because according to the order of nature, children are entirely under the care of their parents until they attain the age of reason. So use here clearly has a subjective dimension grounded in the natural order of things, and hence it pertains to the natural law. It is the use of the parents to raise their own children, and to violate this use would violate, uh, would do an injury to the parents. Now this may not be the most important natural right out there, but Aquinas, what's significant about it is that it's one text where it's very clear that this idea of a natural right that I possess is conceived already in Aquinas' mind. 
So it would not seem a great leap from Aquinas' reasoning here to a, a larger account of natural rights as belonging to persons in view of their nature as free and rational creatures. And this was precisely what happened. Later Dominican Thomists did articulate in the controversies over, for example, the enslavement of the indigenous peoples of the New World, they did articulate just this kind of theory of natural rights. And in the very text that I've been quoting, Aquinas expressly says that even where the civil law, so in another place in that text, even where the civil law places a man in a state of servitude, even if you're a slave, he retains his right of parental governance over his children and also his right to determine how he himself will worship God because these derive from the order of natural or divine right. Quote, no, nor should anyone disrupt the order of natural right by which a son is under the care of his father. This mention of order in Aquinas' account of this, uh, this issue brings us back to the key dimension of Aquinas' account that I emphasized earlier. Aquinas never considers law, nor justice, nor use, the object of justice, as belonging to an individual person abstracted from a wider order, a wider teleological order. Rather, a subjective use or right is for Aquinas always a way of looking at how an individual belongs to a larger order and is himself teleologically ordered according to reason to a good. So now, part two. Subsequent thinkers. Let's shift our focus to figures after Aquinas. To be sure, later thinkers develop a much more substantial account of subjective rights than Aquinas has. Some also have a very different account, a very different theory of natural rights than Aquinas. But it is my claim that such later theories are different from Aquinas, not because they shift from an objective sense of right to subjective rights. That's what most of the contemporary scholarship thinks. That is not where the originality consists in the move from Aquinas to later thinkers, because that's already in Aquinas. What is the difference? It's primarily that later thinkers begin to lose sight of the truth that justice, law, and use all depend on, and in a way are facets of, a wise or reasoned ordering of individuals to the good. That is the key dimension for Aquinas, I'm claiming. So if we were to look at the history of moral theology, William of Ockham, who we heard about uh, in the previous talk, 14th century Franciscan nominalist, he is typically identified as the primary culprit on this score, and probably rightly so. While Aquinas defined law as an ordination of reason for the common good, Occam understood law as ultimately rooted in God's will. It's law because God willed it so. This meant that for Occam, law ceased to be something that wisely orders you to the good and becomes simply a function of God commanding it. And in fact, God could in principle change what he commands or even invert what he commands. Famously, Occam thinks that if God commands you to hate God, your salvation would be in hating God. So that's very far from Aquinas's mind. Aquinas spoke of the use as the object of justice, which is due to someone in view of the complex ordering of individuals and communities to the good. Occam, in contrast, defines this word yus as merely a licit power of a subject. So yus now is not the object of justice, it's just a power that I have. So in Occam, the central role of order, of reason, and of the good, they all disappear from the picture. But it is important that we not stop here, and too many people, I think, do stop at Occam. Because some subsequent figures, including those who oppose Occam, 
and who claim to be interpreting Aquinas. Some of these later thinkers also lost sight of this crucial dimension of Aquinas' thought. And this is particularly, particularly the case with Francisco Suarez, the great Jesuit who in the early 17th century stands at the origin of the distinctive Jesuit line of interpretation of Aquinas. So you have a whole line of people who call themselves Thomists that actually can be traced back to Suarez. Though Suarez praises Aquinas and often cites him, he also consistently alters the meanings of Aquinas' terms, producing a doctrine of law, justice, and rights that is notably different from Aquinas. So time doesn't permit me to go through a lot of examples of this. Let me just give you a couple. At the start of his treatise on uh, law, uh, he wrote a very big book, Suarez did, on law. Suarez sets out to define what law is, lex. For Suarez, the essence of law is not that it is an ordination of reason to the common good. Rather, Suarez reframes it this way. This is a quotation. Law is a certain measure of moral acts in the sense that such acts are characterized by moral rectitude through their conformity to law. So law is a measure of moral acts, and your act is right if you conform to the law. He then adds, in the strict sense of the term, only that is law which imposes an obligation of some sort. Entirely absent from Suarez's definition is any reference to an ordering to the common good. Law is first of all about moral precepts that oblige you to obey. One's actions are good, or actually, he doesn't say good, he says one's actions are right when they conform to the commands of a superior. So as a result, even the terms good and end, which pepper Aquinas' discussion of law and justice, largely disappear from Suarez's treatment. And he replaces them instead with right and wrong. Measures not of whether an action produces a good or leads you to your fitting end, but rather of whether you've conformed your will to the command of the superior. This is also evident when Suarez examines the meaning of jus. While he acknowledges that jus can designate an object of justice, for him, the true meaning of the word, its more strict and proper meaning, he says, is that it is a certain moral power which every man has, either over his own property or with respect to that which is due him. Suarez's definition of jus differs from Aquinas's not so much in the fact that someone can have a jus as a subjective possession, but that Yus no longer has any intrinsic reference to a wider order of relationships, nor is there any reference to a teleological ordering of man or the human community to the good. Okay, part three, drawing some conclusions. Do Thomists have rights? Contemporary commentators often assume that Suarez offers a standard Thomistic natural law account. But as I hope is now evident, Suarez's account of law, justice, and rights has a fundamentally different character than Aquinas's. Not because of a shift from objective to subjective, but rather for two other reasons. One, there is a loss of the recognition that law is fundamentally an ordination of reason to the common good, not the imposition of an obligation by a superior will. And two, there is a loss of the sense that jus is a feature of the overarching teleological ordering to the good in which a person is placed, the rational creature. So for Suarez, jus is simply a moral power of a creature without reference to that order. Suarez may not be the source of these changes in meaning, we might, in fact, blame William of Ockham, 
or we might even point to other figures. Duns Scotus, some say, is the beginning of this tradition. But in any case, Suarez is a major figure in the history of the development of natural rights theories and of the propagation of these ideas in them. And it seems to me that these two changes, when taken together, constitute the mainspring of the development of modern theories of natural rights with their strengths, but also the notable weaknesses identified by, for example, Leo Strauss and many others. So the question then, should we try to return to the purity of the original Thomistic doctrine? Jesuit Thomists, in other words, after Suarez, may have modern rights, but do Dominican Thomists have rights? Can we have rights today? Can we formulate a Thomistic doctrine of rights that would be plausible for us today? So I'd like to answer this by recapitulating in brief the essentials of what I take to be Thomas's position, now trying to give a kind of positive explanation of how to think about this. So you've heard some of this before. It's a, it's a kind of summary. The use or what is due to another, the object of justice, depends on first the overarching order of the cosmos, which is laid out according to God's wise plan and therefore is both intelligible and teleological. And it is composed of persons endowed with reason and free choice who are members of various communities that are themselves arranged in hierarchical order. I'm a member of a family. I'm a member of the Dominican order. I'm a member of a basketball team. I'm a member of the Seahawks nation, rooting for the Seattle Seahawks. And I'm a member of uh, the United States of America. All of these are hierarchical orderings of different societies, each of which have their own uh, proper goods, common goods. Then, second, following on this, jus is a function of the relationality that follows from the place that persons have in this order. If you think of the whole collection of all these different groups as a kind of over, in an overarching order of the cosmos. Nor is this order an abstraction. It is the concrete, particular, historical order in which I find myself. So man comes into the world as the child of parents, not just abstract parents, very concrete parents, these two parents, living in a human community as a creature under God. He has not himself created or generated this order. Consequently, man necessarily and inevitably exists in an interlocking web of relationships, belonging to parts and wholes, or belonging as a part to other wholes, his family, his clan, his city, his NFL team, the whole human race, the whole body of Christ, the whole of creation. These relationships, well, being a Seahawks fan is due to choice. Uh, but these relationships in general are not constant. Actually, if you live in Seattle, you don't have a choice. <laughs> these relationships are not constituted by man's choice in general. Rather, we could say that man is naturally and originally in these relationships. Aquinas' understanding of justice and thus of rights is therefore quite different from the Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment accounts derived from social contract theory, for example, which postulate that man exists first as a kind of independent individual in a primitive state of nature and therefore brings to the relationships that he chooses to enter certain fundamental rights which in a way are anterior to those relationships. Such theories, whether we're talking about Hobbes or Locke or John Rawls, tend to abstract from the concrete historical relationships that I am always in. And we might say the initial conditions into which each of us is born. They aim at developing an account of the basic or fundamental rights that human beings have purely in virtue of being human so that justice then becomes, at least in part, just granting what is due in virtue of those rights abstracted from the order, and so that individuals can then pursue whatever goods they deem worthy of their choice. For Aquinas, in contrast, the ultimate end of man is not a matter of arbitrary choice, not even for God. The whole plan 
of divine providence originates in God's wisdom as an ordination of reason to the good, which is God. And so we are born into the world as creatures who naturally occupy a place in that order and who are naturally ordered to a final end, a good that we do not choose. Neither are our relationships matters of choice. We simply are in family relationships, relations with our neighbors, members of a larger political or civic community. So justice then has to do with our right ordering to a good that we don't determine for ourselves. It's based on a reality outside of us, the order of relations in, it, in which we inevitably exist. So for a Thomist then, rights and we can speak of subjective rights, but these rights are not properties of individuals considered as kind of moral monads, nor is their source really ultimately in an abstract definition of human nature, but rather it's by considering man as a rational and free creature ordered to God and ordered to the common good of the hierarchy of communities that he belongs to. So this allows us then to see how rights for Aquinas are connected to justice, to teleology, and to the common good. So a brief summary here, to justice. Rights then for a Thomist are a way of looking at what is due, the use, insofar it is, as it is due to someone who can vindicate that claim. Because of man's nature, we can draw certain conclusions about what man is, what man ought to be, and therefore how we should treat other persons, since they're equal to us insofar as they're human. Yet rights are not functions of individuals as individuals, on my account, but of persons who belong in a hierarchy of ordered wholes, families, cities, the whole human race, the whole cosmos, each of which has its own common good. So rights in relation to teleology and the common good. Law is, for Aquinas, teleological. It's always ordered to the common good, either real or, or merely apparent, but always there is a good. And rights, then, are always necessarily teleological. They affirm what is required if persons are to be rightly ordered to each other and to the political authority in view of the common good. So to respect the rights of another, that is to give him what is due to him, not only is to give him his private good, it means acting in right relationship to the order of the whole, to the common good. In fact, Aquinas teaches that man's ends, the ends of our lives, are not arranged as a set of goods on a horizontal plane next to each other, but rather in a hierarchy. A man is ordered to individual goods, like the good of his biological life, and then to higher and nobler goods, like the good life that he shares in a virtuous family, or a flourishing and friendly neighborhood, or a just city. And ultimately, to God, the universal common good of the whole universe. So rights can be understood as a function of a just ordering of each person towards these goods. Does this theory of rights offer a plausible alternative for our present political culture? Whether it would win many votes in a popular election, I will not presume to judge. But I think Aquinas would say that no matter what theory we construct, in actual fact, by the very nature of the case, rights unavoidably and always are founded on some prior judgment about the good, either the good for individual persons or for the human community. And if that is true, then our epoch's proliferating claims of incompatible rights should tell us that behind this camouflage of arguing about rights, there is a deeper and more radical disagreement among us about what is good. Our political life then can only improve if we bring these disagreements about the good out into the open, 
where we can have an honest debate about the true end of our common life together, rather than always thinking that we're just arguing about clashing rights. So in the end, do Thomists have rights? I would say yes. Does anyone else have rights? Maybe not. At least not perhaps the kind of rights that will work in a healthy political order. So my talk is supposed to end there. But discussing this last night over dinner with some of the panelists, I discovered that um, some of them thought that I was arguing along the lines of uh, the argument of Patrick Deneen. That may, name may be familiar to some of you. And, and perhaps even supporting Deneen's case, which I was shocked to hear the, that suggestion, as much as I like Pat Deneen. Deneen uh, and, and others who would agree with him holds that rights are a product of an enlightenment mode of thought, and they contain a kind of poison pill that is ultimately destructive of classically liberal regimes of governance. So that he would say the American project, for example, was doomed to failure from the start because uh, it had this idea of uh, modern subjective rights. And we should not be surprised that now those modern subjective rights are being used to justify, for example, the wide-scale killing of unborn children. That's what you're going to get if you make a fundamental mistake like using uh, individual rights. He thinks it's an inevitable corruption of uh, a liberal regime. So when you frame Deneen's argument in this way, I hope it's evident that my argument is in fact the opposite of his. While it may be true that certain Enlightenment versions of rights create mischief, they set up insoluble political conflicts, I don't think that the Thomistic notion of rights will necessarily produce this kind of situation. My claim is that underlying every type of rights claim, there is always going to be hiding somewhere a claim about the good. And so there always remains a real possibility to have a classical debate about how a community should order itself to the good. A regime that recognizes natural rights has not necessarily swallowed a poison pill. In other words, a good Thomist can be a proponent of rights. And in fact, even more, our present regime doesn't necessarily need radical surgery in order to fix the problem, as Deneen thinks. Rather, it just means that we need to recognize what is in fact already there, that rights necessarily involve an ordering to the good. Once we see this, one can see how a regime like ours can be defended as a Thomist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Dominic. I was afraid you were only going to criticize uh, uh, Franciscans and Jesuits. <laughs> um, we have a few minutes for questions. We had to get in a criticism of <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, Since we don't all know each other, I wonder, uh, one, if when you ask a question, if uh, you'd stand so we can see you. And then please introduce, your, uh, introduce yourself so we know who you are. And I'll let you field the questions. Yes. Yeah, hi. My name is David Carl. Uh, I uh, I listen to Bob Dylan's book, and uh, I appreciated how you were getting back to the, the roots of St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, with the lady thinkers, William of Ockham and uh, Suarez. Suarez, do you think that, not that they thought themselves, but as history went on, that their thinking opened the door to more modern modes of thought, like Authoritarianism, utilitarianism, atomistic thinking. But I don't know if I. Yeah. So, in in brief, there there. I mean, I wouldn't be uh, maybe an expert on on all of that, but certainly there are others who think that that is the case. And there's a, a famous book written by uh, a Dominican moral theologian named Servais Pinkers, which is about basically the history of moral theology. And he traces all of the mischief back to William of Ockham uh, and says, basically, Ockham is like a nuclear fission in moral theology. Once you've split the atom, you get this enormous energy moving away from the center. Uh, and, and it ends up, you know, you have different permutations of it. Um, but all of it 
is somehow missing the key thing at, at the center. Uh, and so he, you know, Pinkers really thinks that Occam inaugurates a very, um, well, the beginning of a long series of confusions. Now, you know, Suarez, I'm quite sure, would not be sympathetic to Occam. He wants to not follow Occam. Uh, and so he's going to, you know, he's, he's going to present a theory that is much closer to Aquinas in many respects. But the, what I was trying to focus in on is, is on this, some of these core uh, issues of law and justice and ordering to the good. How does, how does Suarez understand them? And actually, he doesn't understand them uh, the way Aquinas understands them. Yeah, but it would seem, it would seem impossible to go, if you follow Aquinas by the book, that you wouldn't go, you wouldn't go down those paths eventually. I think that's true. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Since I asked the question about your compatibility with Patrick Deneen last night, uh, sorry, Chad Peck from Catholic University of America, uh, I, I want to hear you say a little bit more about the compatibility between natural rights conceived in the social contract tradition with Thomas. Because if, if there isn't a poison pill, which I'm willing to entertain that notion, if there isn't a poison pill, then you need to say how there's a splitting of the difference between modern natural rights account. It, it, that you need to say why a modern account of natural subjective rights fits, as long as you put it into the right ordering of reason to the common good, that the modern account fits with the 13th century account in order for your claim to work about any. Yeah, so I mean here I'm really in the presence of much more expert people on exactly that point, so I think probably we'll hear from, from uh, Charles Kessler or from Philip Munoz about this. Uh, like what, how could you read the American founding, for example, in a way where it would be, uh, you know, more, a more consistent story could be told, yeah. even though they are obviously influenced by enlightened figures and in, you know, you could say, well, the founders are just giving you John Locke, or John Locke is a really bad guy. Um, I know that uh, you know Dr. Munoz has done some research on Locke and might be able to explain why John Locke is not as bad as you might think. Um, but in any case, I think you always will have this backdrop of an order to the common good. That is, I would contend, real, even if people don't acknowledge that it's there. Agreed. And so, no matter we can take what we've got and we can see how they, they did have an idea of the common good in, in the backdrop. They may not have made all of the explicit connections about how the rights are ordered to that, but they presumed that to be the case. And I think everyone, if you really push them, in the end does kind of presume that to be the case, that rights are going to be relative to some kind of, some kind of good. We just don't, we don't talk about it very much. But when you begin, the, I mean, the more you, you lose the sense of there being actually a common good uh, or um, when you lose the sense that there is any objective good for a person and that we can just by our own willing make the good. Now I don't think the American founders uh, thought that um, but if, if you begin to think that then you are in very deep uh, water. But then the da daylight between you and Patrick Deneen would be Incompatibilist versus fragmented compatibilism. Right. If maybe. We, maybe. Yeah. That I sounds. Mean, that sounds. I'm intimidated by the, the uh, <laughs> by the gravity of, of having to commit to one of those. But uh, but yeah. Maybe. Maybe. It's. I mean, just to say, it's not so exaggerated a difference. Well, except that I think Patrick really does think that um, you know, if you have any kind of rights, you've already. Well, maybe I'm caricaturing his view, uh, but I think he, he thinks, I mean, so Patrick, if you're listening, I, I hope I'm not misdescribing what you're saying, but my sense is that once you accept uh, any sense of rights that are derived from, from the Enlightenment, um, you're going to end up with insoluble <coughs> conflicts. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he does think that it's irredeemable. Yeah. yeah. I'm Sharif Darius, uh, I'm at Princeton grad student there. Um, so I assume that a lot of people who are hostile to the idea of natural rights 
agree and are happy to agree that there's objective moral truth. There's a, it's more, it's objectively true that I ought not to torture you. Um, and then they think that the harm comes in the further claim that that means that I have a right against your torture. So what do you think the second thing adds to the first? To frame it as a right, as opposed to just saying it's, it's just? Yeah. I mean, this in a way gets back to what uh, uh, Professor Bigger was talking about earlier. Right. But I took his talk yeah. to be, in a way, pressing that question. Like, what do we gain? He thinks there are risks in moving to the second sentence. What do you think we gain in moving to the second sentence? Uh, well, for one thing, it's the tradition that we live in has moved to the second sentence. So in a way, we're inheriting. We inhabit an, an order, you know? We're born into it. And uh, we should try to live in the order that we're in. Um, maybe that's a very Burkean uh, point to make. But I mean, that would be it's a kind of first reason that Thomas should care about this, it seems to me. Um, but then secondly, you do have, um, we, we want to find a way for the, the law to allow you to vindicate uh, a particular uh, claim of an injustice. And I mean, I don't really think that these are that incompatible ways of thinking because even for Aquinas, like, even when he's not explicitly talking about it as subjective right, he thinks that something is due, and we can talk about it being your due. You know, it's due to you. So the idea that you could claim that it's due to you, I just don't think that that's that I significant a shift. Compatible. I was wondering if you thought there was more content to the second thing than the first thing. Well, OK, this, I guess, is part of the contemporary debate. So people think that there's a lot of a change in meaning when you go from objective to subjective. And I, I guess I just don't think that it's that significant to go from one to the other, as long as you understand the right as being a, another way of formulating the general claim about the just ordering. And not, now where you have a problem is where the second claim becomes detached from that and you begin to think that it's an absolute claim. And sometimes that produces absurd claims of rights as Professor Bigger was enumerating for us, um, you know, a, a claim, a right that no one is ever going, ever going to be able to fulfill, or an absolute right, you know, that is uh, detached from from participating in society in a meaningful way. I mean, that, that's obviously destructive. Yes. I'm Donna Gorman, I'm a So could you just clarify? Maybe it's getting in this issue. So you talk about um, this hierarchy of communities starting at the center maybe God, the South, and going out in the large community. But I guess what I'm a little confused about is, are you saying, where is the hierarchy in rights or rights? Is that with the, is the predominant right the individual or the larger community, or are these are in tension with each other, and is that the issue? Yeah, so that's an excellent question, because this is where often the discussion goes like, okay, you, we have the common good out there, and we might even talk about that in a certain sense as the right of the community to, like, the right of the of the community to assemble in a room without a drill being buzzing above your head, you know. And the guy upstairs is like, hey, it's it, it's a free country. I'm gonna just do what I want to do, and I don't care if it disrupts the common good of this. Uh, okay, so we can we can come up with ways that we think individual rights are in tension with the common good somehow. Uh, and I think that's part of the reason why this is such an important topic. From the Thomistic perspective that I'm trying to articulate, if you, if you get the rights figured out uh, in reference to the ordering to the good, it shouldn't in the end be possible to have a right that you could assert over against a genuine common good. Either it won't be a genuine right or it won't be the genuine common good because Rights are a way of understanding what is due to the individual as a member of the community or in, in that larger order. So that does mean that rights have a kind of relative status in function of the, the community. It does not mean, however, that um, you could never assert a right over against a political authority. Aquinas gives a very good example of one that you could assert, and that is that the king cannot baptize your child if you don't want your child baptized. And Aquinas thinks that that is a function. So there you might say, well, where's the order? What order are you talking about there? Aquinas thinks it's the order 
of the individual to the highest common good, which is God. And an ordering to the highest common good trumps an ordering to other, you know, what, what lower spheres might claim as a good. So there you could say to the king, uh, no way, I'm not, I'm not doing what you say, and I have a right which comes from God in virtue of, I mean, it's not just a divine positive law, but it's in virtue of the fact that I'm created with a rational nature. That is, I'm free, and I know, I act according to reason and to, and to free choice. And that, for Aquinas, we, we are free and rational creatures in order to worship God, ultimately. And then I guess, see, I'm good on this. Aquinas would say that because the law is unjust, it's in fact not a law. That's yes. Right. That's right. Yes. Uh, so just to follow up a little bit on your answer to that question, uh, by the way, I'm Gabby Burbank, I'm a Christian PhD, very esteemed. Um, but do you think that there is a basis for natural rights in Aquinas? Do you think he considers and get up to the same So that's a very good question, and we could get into um, also a very deep discussion about religious liberty and the Vatican Declaration of Dignitatis Humanae, which is very, very interesting questions about, uh, about that. Uh, briefly, I would say there are clearly some claims of rights that we encounter today, which Aquinas would not think are real rights, because they'd be incompatible with the, uh, an order into the, to the good. So, uh, I mean, a right to an abortion would be an example that I think would be fairly clear in Aquinas. Um, but we could talk about any number of other, other sorts of things um, where Aquinas would, would uh, have an objection. Uh, the particular question then about um, what is the role of like a political authority with respect to religion, um, that is a more complicated question because Aquinas certainly thinks that the political authority cannot coerce someone to become a Christian. But if you freely choose to become a Christian, then you have to live as a Christian. And then you can be ordered by the Christian community, even in some measure uh, what we would consider to be coerced. So we would not have a problem with a very a uh, minimal sense of like the discipline that a group could exercise on its members. You know, the, the coach of the, um, of the Seattle Seahawks can bench a player because he, which, which team was it that benched one of their starters because he wore the wrong uniform this season? It was, this was, did anybody see this? One of the, one of the players, or no, he, he, wore, he wore casual clothes on the plane. Carolina. Yeah, there we go. So. Uh, the coach benched one of his starters because the guy wore casual clothes on the team plane on the flight to the game. And, okay, that's maybe not the best coaching decision, or, I mean, maybe, maybe it is. If you want to be a member of that team, then the coach can sanction you. Uh, and we would also recognize, well, if you're going to be a member of the Catholic Church, but you're going around telling people there are four persons in the Trinity, the church can say, hey, you gotta knock it off, and we're, we, you know, we're gonna like say you can't preach in church anymore or something like that. So that kind of sanction is obviously permitted. What about more severe sanctions? That, well, then you get into a prudential question about how, how much can you coerce somebody to make him, once he's professed to join the team, to make him play for your team. Um, Yes.
Yeah, so for, for Patrick Deneen, what is the poison pill? I think it is, um, let's see, maybe I can ask to be corrected. I know uh, Dr. Munoz knows, knows <laughs> Deneen's argument rather well, knows Deneen rather well. Um, uh, I think it's that once you admit that you have these individual rights which a subject possesses and I can assert it, and you say that's really the basis for our political community, the fact that you have these rights and um, they have to be protected, what you have done is atomize political life where you've given, basically, you've, you've so decentralized political life that you will have insoluble conflicts over the good because you will define the good in your way, in a way that might be completely crazy, and, but you're, you're going to you know, beat me over the head with, with the fact that you have a right to, to do it this way. And I'm gonna define the good in my way, and, you're, you know, and so you're gonna end up in uh, that kind of situation. Is that, you think that's fair, or would he make it more? Yeah, I think he'd say the, the, the elevation of consent, which is really the elevation of will, uh, is, is the sort of fundamental error. So the voluntarism is yeah. yeah, I'd say you, you my, my understanding was that there's a deep agreement that the Jesuits are responsible for. <laughs> <laughs> My 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 point there there are some there have been some there have been some great Jesuit Thomists and my, my point is that but but it is true that uh, Dominicans and Jesuits have had disagreements for a long time uh, and about the interpretation of Aquinas so I I don't want to be you know overly polemical about it um, but I think that there it's it's correct to identify historically speaking a line of interpretation. Uh, in one school that is in conflict with the line of interpretation in another school. And there's very famous uh, clashes there in history over precisely some of these things. So if any of you know uh, the history of debates over grace in the 16th century, famous controversy called the De Auxilis controversy, which raged for decades to the point that the Pope finally had to um, basically call time out and said, neither side may continue to publish on this issue um, because they, they could publish, they could not say the other side was correct. Okay, that's right. You couldn't, you, because obviously there was a temptation to call each other uh, heretics over over this, and that was a that was a major debate. Suarez was one of the figures in that debate, and Suarez's views. This is a subject for another paper. Suarez's views on the relationship of grace and free will are closely connected to his interpretation of law and obligation. We'll take a uh, short break and uh, re reassemble at 3.30. And uh, break is in the same place as before. And uh, Dr. Kessler will, will address us next at 3.30. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.